our religion, Allah has made it flexible in this way, in that it's meant to accommodate the good of every culture. And historically, that's the way Islam has always been until very recently. Historically, we do not have this idea of Muslims forcing a culture upon another society. The earliest, earliest example I could find of this is when the Sahaba conquered Syria. When the Sahaba conquered Syria and Umar ibn al-Khattab went to visit the Sahaba in Syria, what was his comment? His comment was, Syria has changed everybody except Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarraf. What did he mean by this comment? He meant that every other Sahabi had changed their lifestyle from the Medinan lifestyle to the Syrian lifestyle. Only Abu Ubaidah was still living his life as if he's in Medina. Right? He was another level of awliya. Note that Umar radiallahu anhu did not stop the other Sahaba from living like Syria. He simply made a comment about it. He didn't stop them. He didn't tell them, you have to dress like the people of Medina. You have to live like the people of Medina. You have to do the same thing. In fact, there's another conversation uh, recording some of the history books. So when he visited Muawiyah, when, after Muawiyah became the governor of, of, of Syria, and he asked Muawiyah, you know, why are you living like a king? And Muawiyah said that the people of Syria, they used to be ruled by the Romans, and they are accustomed to their leader dressing and living like this. So when they see their leader dressing and living like this, they respect him and they are loyal to him. So Umar left it at that. He left it at that because he understood it's a different culture and they have a different cultural expectation of their leader. And that's why the people of Syria were loyal to Muawiyah for 40 years, long longer than any other Muslim leader, because he understood their culture, he adapted to their culture, and he put it into their culture. He didn't come with the Qureshi culture and force it upon Syria. He moved to Syria and he, he blended into the Syrian culture. And he became part of the Syrian people from the way he dressed to the way he lived to the way he entertained himself to the way he gave his, his khutbahs. Everything was completely based on Syrian culture. And so now we see this throughout our history. Ottoman culture was very different from Abbasid culture. Even within the Ottoman Empire, the culture of Ottoman Turkey was very different from the culture of Ottoman Egypt, right? Uh, Ottoman Makkah, because they kept the culture of each land. When the Ottomans took over a land, they did not try and force Turkish upon the people. They did not try and force the people to, to, to dress like Turkish individuals or to adopt their, their cultural uh, lingo. They left the cultures as they are. Our religion has a very simple principle. When people become Muslim, they give up the haram of their culture only. Everything else stays the mm. same. Everything else is fine. So a white man can convert to Islam and live a completely white lifestyle, just giving up his alcohol and a few other things. Same with, with the African, same with the Indian, same with a, a Malay. And again, look at the Muslim world today. Look at Hanafi Muslim world today. The Hanafi Islam of Turkey is different from the Hanafi Islam of India. Why? Because of their cultures. Their cultures are, are diverse. And both of these are completely acceptable forms of the Hanafi madhab. Right? Nobody says, or maybe some extremists do, but nobody in general says that Turkish Hanafi Islam is wrong and Indian Hanafi Islam is right. right? Rather, they both understood that these are the Hanafi madhab according to this orb and that orb. So my call to the people is, we need a Islam according to our orb. The mistake our forefathers made when they moved to these lands is that they brought their culture believing it to be Islam. And they kind of mixed Islam and culture to a level where they're unable to distinguish between the two. Classical example is the topi, right? The covering the head for a Muslim man. There is nothing in the Quran and nothing in the Hadith that says that a Muslim man has to cover his head. There's nothing like this. There's no reward for it. There's no punishment for not doing it. There's nothing like this. It is simply... But practically, practically speaking, in Arabia 1,400 years ago, they, for practical reasons, you would short. cover your head. Yeah, they would wear short to yeah. protect themselves from the sun yeah. and from the dust, Yeah. Right? So it's a, it was a very practical, and only that too, again, cultures evolve over time. For the of majority course, yeah. of cultures in human history, it was respectable for a man to wear a hat, even in Western cultures. Mm. Even in yes, Western cultures, the they used to yeah. wear their hats a few years ago. Now, yes. the point is cultures change. And the mm. culture we live in today, wearing a hat for a man is not a norm. Now, mm. is the head of a man aura? No. Is there a religious significance to covering your head? No. Is it the cultural norm to cover your head? Depends in which country you are in. So, mm -hmm. when I'm in South Africa, I don't normally cover my head because it's not a cultural norm in South Africa. Now, if I'm going to a Diobandi masjid, I will cover my head to respect their culture. In fact, when mm -hmm. I went to Kenya, 
I wore topi mm. for the full trip and a kurta for the full trip because that was actually their culture there. <laughs> Even when I met the, yeah. I met a member of government. I met the, the uh, I think it was the governor. I actually met the governor of, of Mombasa. He was wearing a kurta and topi. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that was their culture. So I dress. If you look at the picture of me and him, we're wearing the exact same kurta and the exact same topi because what I mm. do is I dress according to the culture. So when I went to Malaysia, wow. I wore a suit because the ulama they wear suits. When I went to Kenya, I wore kurta mm. and topi because the ulama they wear kurta and topi. My point is, in South Africa, you know, we imported and we kind of forced upon people this kurta and topi thing, and it's not working because there's like a clash here now. Now we have this clash that young people are looking at this kurta and topi as an imported thing, and the older people are looking at it as Islam. And now the young people are like, yeah. if I have to wear this to practice Islam, I'm not going to practice Islam. And this is the mindset Basically, they have. Yeah. I, like I've actually mm. met young people who told me that they wanted to become alims, but then they realized they'll have to wear kurta and topi full time, and they put them off. So if I'm at least mm. the one mm. alim in town who's not wearing kurta and topi, at least they have an idea. Okay, it, you don't you don't have to wear kurta and topi to be an alim, right? So maybe they'll mm. be motivated to go and do their studies. 